Paradise 2069 Written by x -Tice. Spoken by Ben from Nexus Nemesis Chapter 1 Hell, Hell. Ace was in need of reality. Actually, he felt at home in cyberspace more than anywhere else. Actually, cyberspace with all its pixels, data and bytes was his home. Obviously he didn't know anything else any longer. He perhaps never did at all. But too beautiful the thought, too unreal to be true that this world really was his home, for he would lose the ground under his feet if he stayed too long here. He was in need of reality. He needed to know what was real and what wasn't. There was a callous ticking noise. The connector at the deck on his head had loosened itself. From one moment to another the colors and pixels came undone and now, once again, he saw his dirty, analog room. His view was wandering through the grayness. This room was his so-called home. Empty pizza boxes and empty bottles laid around everywhere on the floor. At least he hadn't forgotten to keep his body alive while being online. But the waste on the floor slowly started to gain control over the entire room. He definitely was back in reality and he immediately started wondering why. But he also had to live here. As a professional hacker, Ace knew about the dangers of getting lost in cyberspace. In this world, consisting of bits and bytes, he was gathering data and selling them to the big business groups if the things he found were interesting enough to yield some credits. He was searching and searching and muckraked in the waste of nearly every company. He felt despair because he hadn't found anything interesting for a fairly long time. Slowly but surely, he had to reconsider something new to earn his living, like gathering information from the big groups, even though he didn't do anything else all the time. The companies became more and more careful with leaving information in cyberspace. Even though they ruled this world, they couldn't have their eyes and ears everywhere, and someday they would make a small mistake, perhaps only a tiny note. But Ace knew when this day came up, he would be there to find something important in that waste of data. Back in the old days, he summed up. Yes, back in the old days, all this was much easier. In fact, back in the old days wasn't that long ago. In that time, everything was safe somewhere and no one cared about security. One could easily avoid the safety systems, but now... Now, nothing remains where it was. All the paths, all data vanish as fast as they came into being. People didn't just become more careful, they nearly got paranoid. But this evening he wanted to forget about his sorrows and just get away from the grayness of his apartment. He was in need of reality in color. The club was calling. Like the position light of an airport, flashy lights showed Ace the way to that old bunker that promised some safety from the group wars which was the biggest club in town. It was just called the bunker, and it was full as hell, like half the city did come together here. On stage there were four figures dressed up in black and neon green, hammering on their instruments. Three of that four band members were wearing black and green hair pieces. The fourth one had a mohawk, similar to Ace. Like Ace, the fourth one had a connector on his shaved scalp. 
so the band did know cyberspace as well. But who could shut oneself off to cyberspace nowadays? Except of some religious zealots, nearly everyone living close to a glass fiber connection was addicted to cyberspace. Music was booming through the hall, and the mass was partying. Ace's first way led him to the bar. He needed some flush pills to make the hammering music become a pleasant mash with the flashy lights. After that, he forged ahead until he could see the band from the first row, when suddenly the music stopped. This means access to hell. Who wants to have it? The vocalist shouted holding a tiny chip in his hands above his head for everyone to see it and cast it into the masses. The chip was landing directly in Ace's hands while the crowd was screaming and partying. The music broke off again with a heart-kicking bass and the drug pack started dancing again. Ace was also caught by the music and quickly put the chip in his pocket where he immediately forgot it. The music the whole evening was much more important now. He wanted to party and dance to let him forget about everything else. Ace was moving ecstatically to the music when a sexy girl in a really hot outfit showing more skin than clothes squeezed herself into his focus. She smiled alluringly, came up to him and whispered into his ear. Hello Ace, I'm Myra. I've already been waiting for you. Tonight is our night. She kissed him on his cheek, and in the next second she disappeared in the crowd, but only for short. Just one moment later, he saw her in the cage on the side of the stage, tossing her body to the beat ecstatically. So she was a dancer of the club. Indeed, Ace should not forget this night. With pounding head aches, Ace awoke in his thermal form futon the next morning. He squinted through the smudged window into the setting sun. He must have slept away all the day. Cuffing, he sat up and rubbed his eyes. A strange smell was intoxicating the air. Ace looked next to him on his futon. It was empty. The smell came from Myra's musky perfume. The events of last night flickered before Ace's mind. He smiled at the thought of the club, the music, and of course, Myra. But where was she? The last of what he could remember was how he fell asleep in Myra's arms, sweaty and exhausted. The memory of their shared passionate night made him shiver, and he forgot about his throbbing headache for a moment. Besides her perfume smell, in the otherwise stuffy air of this room, nothing indicated Myra's presence. She must have left long before Ace awakened. It was kind of hard for Ace to organize his thoughts. The memory of Myra besotted his mind. Too strange were the things that happened, and to Ace such things never happened before. He has known Myra only for a few hours, but she kept haunting his thoughts. There was something diabolical in her way Ace didn't have a clue of. With some effort, Ace lifted himself from the thermal foam and staggered with root into his deck and booted it. With a beep, the processor started to work and the LED lights flashed to indicate that the deck was ready in a few moments. His stomach attracted attention to itself with a gurgling noise, calling for something to eat this way. So Ace went to the fridge and spotted a halfway edible looking instant burger. He pulled the strap of the heating module at the package of the burger and heard the hiss of the typical chemical reaction that heated the burger. With the burger in his hand, he sat down in front of his deck and activated the screen. Because his head aches didn't seem to get better, he didn't feel like getting connected to the cyberspace and he was satisfied with a two-dimensional view of his screen. Besides, he didn't need anything else for checking his mails and some minor research tasks. Listlessly, he clicked through the spam mails, which made him aware of his lack of genital size and promoting the necessary preparations from mutagenic tablets, which would help him to overcome this problem. A brief smile crossed his face as he again had to think of the night with Myra. 
He didn't hope to be depending on such offers from the spam mails one day, and he deleted them as usual. But then he had to pause. Between all the offers to improve his sex life, he discovered a mail with the subject Data Transfer Request. His interest was aroused. He only hoped that the mail didn't contain any virus, and so he first ran the antivirus scanner before he opened the mail. From sheer astonishment, he dropped his instant burger. A company called Herc Corporation commissioned him to sell all the information he had gathered so far to the company. The contract value was immense. Ace had never received such an order before. With this order, he would earn more money than he could otherwise get in a whole year. But something made him hesitate. Why did her corporation want to buy all of his data? And why did the company especially emphasize his interest in all of his data without exception? Ace could not imagine what the group needed it for. Her corporation. Did he know the company? He was thinking hard. He had heard the name before. Shaking his head, he typed the name into the search engine. There were far too many search results to make him want to read them all. The only thing he knew immediately was that her corporation was a military company. But what did they want from him? Ace remembered the chip he got from the band last night. He almost forgot about it, thanks to Myra. Whether this strange job had something to do with this chip? Ace was curious. He pulled the chip out of his pants, which he found in the corner of his room, and put it into his deck. On the chip there was only one file, named Corex X. He couldn't open the file with the screen mode of his deck, so he grabbed his jumper cables and locked into cyberspace. The real world disappeared and was replaced by the pixel icons and navigation of the cyberspace. He immediately activated the file on the chip, but something went wrong. A program immediately seemed to run an installation procedure, but Ace couldn't make out where. The memory of his deck was not affected. Even processing power of the deck was not taken for the program. Immediately, Ace activated all virus protection programs he had, but they could not locate the program either. Nevertheless, it was there. He felt it. A small icon with the name of Corex X was flashing besides Ace's control symbols and indicated that the program was running. The program was activated. He could not access it. He tried to fix the problem by logging off. Maybe he had only to restart the deck. He pulled the plug from its socket on the head and the real world received him again. But something was different. He looked around. Everything looked as usual. But then he saw it. The Corex X icon was still flashing in his field of view and he felt like the program was still running. Again and again, Ace touched the connector on his head and intuitively grabbed for the cable that should connect him to cyberspace. But there was none. He was in reality. Everything around him was real. Only the program Corex X did not disappear. Only some minutes after he had logged off from cyberspace, the program began to work in Ace's head. He heard a noise which calmed him down. Even more, it almost entranced him. But at the same time, his head ages increased more and more. With bloodshot eyes, he stared out of the window at the sub-ghettos in the middle of the Havel Zone, which he called home. The Havel Zone was a huge consortium of various towns that once had names such as Berlin, Potsdam and Oranienburg. But now, there was only a wild chaos of skyscrapers, factories and scrapyards. The sun now was swallowed completely by the crumbling high-rise roofs, which were peppered with antennas. Here and there, the neon billboards and holo screens pointed to the dawn of the nightlife. Ace held his ears, but the noise did not disappear. Just as little, the closing of his eyes could prevent him from seeing the constantly blinking Corex X icon. Whatever it was, it was in Ace and did not want to disappear. He felt like sick. Ace had to figure out what had happened. For a moment he closed his eyes, hoping to be able to forget it. In vain. 
The flashing Korok's axe eye can remind him that he had to do something. Cumbersome, Ace moved to his deck and locked into cyberspace. It was time to put his skills as data collector on test and to fucking find out what had happened. Right when his brain was flooded with the data of cyberspace, the haunting sound was gone. His home, cyberspace. He felt almost well again, but the flashing Corex X icon reminded him that it was only a false feeling of security. Ace didn't even want to think of the fact that he had to lock off from cyberspace again sometime, only to be again tortured by the roaring noise in his head. But for now, he had his peace, and had to use the circumstance to find any solution to get rid of Corex X. He had almost no evidence what this might be all about. The chip he had received from the band last night was everything he had. Well, it was a beginning. After all, the band had to have received the program from somewhere. A thought of a crazy marketing gag organized by the band in order to achieve publicity. That would be imaginable. It wouldn't be the first band sticking at nothing in order to be the big issue of the yellow press. The band Nuclear Radiation had given their most loyal fans radioactively irradiated t-shirts, which glowed in the dark quite nice. Unfortunately, the management had misjudged the dose of the uranium content in the tissues of the t-shirts and lost almost the entire fan club due to fatal leukemia. The new album would have flopped totally if the union of the atomic scientists wouldn't have met a license agreement with the band. Thus the new album became an official soundtrack of the advisory film called Improper Handling of Radiant Resources Part 3. All you need to know about testicular cancer. But Ace couldn't remember the name of the band that played yesterday. Something with ecstasy or something like that. Maybe the club's cyberspace domain contained more information. Ace activated his avatar and typed in the cyberspace coordinates to navigate to the club. The funny thing with the cyberspace domain of the club The Bunker was that this virtual location was corresponding to the original 100%. The owners of the club had digitized every inch of the old bunker building with 3D scanners. The even bigger thing was that you had also to pay admission here. There are enough people like Ace who feel quite more comfortable in cyberspace than in real life. Ace entered his PIN number as at the entrance of the virtual club opened a window with a reminder. As Ace's avatar headed into the club he really had the feeling to be in a real club for a moment, but that feeling faded immediately when he saw the other guests. A three foot tall talking penis just flirted with a neon yellow Hello Kitty character at the bar. Each user can create his avatar as he wishes. In this case, the intent of the oversized fellow symbol was not to be overlooked. Cybersex. Ace had to smile inwardly. There are definitely things that are more fun in reality. Ace started to look for a party app that certainly would offer more information about the band that played here yesterday. The parties are always identical both in cyberspace and in reality. In front of the pinkish gleaming party ads, he was taken aback. Only the pink gleam on a pixel wall was there. He went to the bar to ask one of the waiters for the program, but the waiter only asked for his order. Ace tried to interview some guests who, however, interpreted his question as a flirt invitation. An elephant with motley camouflage patterns on its trunk finally told him that he stayed here more often and that he also was here yesterday. Just as Ace wanted to ask him about yesterday's band, the elephant avatar faded away. A system breakdown of the elephant's user deck. Ace cursed. It could take half a century until the user could go online again if the deck was affected by the breakdown. Ace decided to wait and to stop contacting other people. Sitting in a corner, he used the waiting time for reflecting. Something seemed strange to him. The fact that he hadn't gained information on yesterday evening's band yet took him aback. First the empty party ad, then the ignorant waiters and finally the breakdown of the only known person? Not for nothing Ace was a hacker. For safety reasons he activated his source code scanner 
to have a look at the club's structure. Source codes for cyberspace products are protected by copyright, so it was strictly forbidden to look at it. The software to do so was illegal, but the software of the club did not avail the required protective systems that would make it dangerous to a hacker. Thus Ace did not take a high-risk hacking into the club's source code. However, there also were defense systems that could kill a hacker since feedback into the plugged-in hacker's brain can cause immediate death. As a matter of course, no halfway able hacker would dare to attack a so protected system without the required safeguards. It was told time and again, however, that Attack Kid had his brain fried by a group mainframe because he thought to be able to have a look at the bank statements of a million earning member of the board using his parents' discounter deck. Since such tech kits mostly came from respectable families, the parents could sue that member of the board due to the money they were not forced to spend for private school, personal trainer, private rehab weeks of the kids, and that could be paid to some able lawyers to get the millions out of the member of the board. Actually, after taxes and proceeding costs, the only winners are the lawyers. This may be the reason why Ace so often runs into tutorials for hacking beginners sponsored by law firms. These were not problems Ace had to face since he owned his adequately secured deck and the club did not own security systems worth mentioning. Ace scanned the source code for irregularities and the software suddenly stopped. He tried once again, but he got stuck in the same position. A security system would have allowed him to use the system at all. He looked at the source code stretch and realized he's not the only one hacking into this code. Exactly this stretch of source code was being rewritten by another user and this user's presence was as illegal as his since the software would not have got stuck. Mirror mode. That means that Ace mirrored his avatar directly into the club's source code in order to be able to move around and have not only a 2D view of the program code. This was somehow more dangerous. His deck had to produce two avatars, one still sitting in the virtual club and the other one in the next dimension of cyberspace. Ace had to be twice as careful now and look after both avatar mirrors. The graphical structure of the source code was much more abstract as usual in cyberspace. Normal cyberspace reflects reality to make it easier to the normal user. Deeper processes such as source code are structured much more complex, which however was not a problem to Ace the hacker. Immediately after entering the source code, Ace was surrounded by all possible symbols and geometrical figures forming the invisible parts of the source code. Ace immediately activated his stealth function and moved his now invisible avatar towards the stretch of source code where he supposed the other intruder to be. A black spot between all the colored signs and characters appeared. Ace knew that this was the one he sought. Ace once again checked his stealth function and hoped that the other one's software wasn't better than his. He moved directly beside the black spot. The spot was stuck at a source code module modifying it. The module symbol changed their shapes. Ace checked the modification taking place. The system identified the module as the club's documentation module recording all the events happening at the club. He stored the other intruder's signature and searched the source code for more modifications. The modifications were easily found. The waiter module the party app module and the bouncer module that removed unwanted avatars from the club. Eventually it dawned on Ace that this intruder had modified everything that could let him find the band's track. He immediately aimed at the intruder and tried to discover his identity. Ace unleashed his scanning software. That was dangerous, but Ace could not risk that the other hacker disconnected and his only clue simply went off. Contently, he looked at the window displaying at the scanning process. The first data of the other hacker appeared in front of Ace. The other one seemed not to be a pro. First the position was displayed. It was, of course, encrypted, but Ace would be a really bad data collector if encrypted data were a major problem to him. 
He started the decoder and waited for the result while he was keeping an eye on the back spot of the documentation module. Ace only saw two words before the detonation. Herc Corporation. The name of the company that ordered the transfer of all his data. From one moment to the next, the club dissolved. The source code as well as the graphical interface were just gone. The avatar simply stood in the empty cyberspace. Ace immediately deactivated the mirror mode to be fully operational again. Ace didn't know what had happened, but he knew that there was big trouble ahead. Even before he and the other avatars could resize what had happened, the attack was launched, the Corex X symbol light in red color. Then Ace saw them coming. Destroyer programs. Destroyer programs are programs for attacking avatars. Hackers often use them to intrude some place, but they are used to defend against hacker attacks as well. Most of the hackers optically design their destroyer programs as nuclear missiles, white sharks or some other ideas for representing the bad. The destroyer program that had started attacking lacked The destroyer program that had started attacking lacked a special appearance. They simply wear red stripes that was not a good sign as Ace knew. Such plane programs almost were used by groups since only the program's function was important to them. Hackers think more visual and symbolic in these cases. There were about a dozen of these programs approaching them. All of a sudden they split into halves, one of which approached Ace and the other one the black spot at high speed and intruded it. Only some instances later the black spot was gone. The destroyer programs had hacked into his avatar. There was no more way to say what happened to the hacker. Depending on the destroyer's danger level, this may have very bad consequences. The other hacker was not really a full-fledged professional as Ace recalled. Now the remaining destroyer started to attack Ace. The Corex X symbol suddenly turned black, but Ace didn't have any time now to deal with it. Ace activated all his defense systems available. Red blinking lights reminded Ace of the fact that the deck was now delivered maximum performance. The first destroyer hit his avatar was wrecked. Happy end by now. Ace reached for the dissolving parts and tried to get some information out of the self-destroying attack program. He immediately stored the program code fragments he got hold of on his hard disk, hoping to be able later to find out more about the unknown attacker. The first attack on Ace had hardly failed when the remaining destroyers changed colors from red to orange, a modification to adapt to Ace's defense systems. These programs were good. The destroyers speeded towards Ace like kamikaze fighters, toward an aircraft carrier. Banzai! He only had one choice, the emergency exit. Like a rotten egg hitting the windshield, Ace was tossed into reality. The neuronal space was deleted from his consciousness in a neuronal explosion and erased by a reality hitting him like a hammer. Running with sweat and with poking head, Ace disconnected from his deck that was beeping and blinking all kinds of alarm colors. Immediately after he was back in reality, he noticed again that this crushing sound in his head and the Corex X symbol still hanging within his field of vision, which didn't want to disappear. Ace felt lousy. The physical shock of an emergency exit from cyberspace in combination with the Corex X noise into his head almost was too much for Ace. Climbing to his seat to avoid falling down, he tried to breathe more quietly, but his condition simply did not want to improve. When he tried to stand up with a bumping heart, he blacked out. He tried to keep himself on his leg, but fell. His hat hit an old TV set that has been placed beside his deck for some months. Ace clung to a chair leg and tried to pull himself on the chair again. Each movement hurt and the noise in his head still increased. It was hell spreading in his brain. It took him all efforts to form another clear thought. There was no chance of reacting in reality. He had to go back to cyberspace to carry on his investigations. Maybe he could use the data of the first destroyer program. 
The other hacker of her cooperation also was really baffling him. At least this damned noise in his head would disappear after the login which would mean an improvement of his situation. But he should be bitterly mistaken. Ace pinched his eyes and put the plug back into his head port. The deck connected him to cyberspace again, but the noise didn't want to disappear this time. It changed to be more digital, more constant, but it still was there, even though it was not as much pesky as in reality. Still better than before, Ace thought. The emergency exit affected the deck's hardware. Many systems didn't run faultlessly anymore, and the deck's performance had decreased considerably. This will be expensive, since spare parts for professional decks did cost too much. The destroyer program remaining source code waited for being looked at. There was not much useful to be found, but Ace could find a signature of the producer. Newton Technologies. Every hacker knew Newton Technologies. It was one of the biggest software companies producing any imaginable kind of software. Ace himself used some of Newton Technologies software, but it was new to him that they also produce aggressive software like destroyers. He started to search cyberspace for information on this software. For security reasons, Ace kept the stealth mode. He snapped some rumors saying that there's also a secret department within Newton Technologies that had specialized in so-called offensive software. After he had seen the destroyers working, there had to be something about these rumors. He needed secured information. He continued his investigations. At some time he had the feeling that there was a lot more to detect with Newton Technologies. Cracker mode. Ace became a cracker. Normal people think that a hacker can do almost everything in cyberspace with a suitable software and experience. But that was true only partially. The true top of the digital food chain are crackers, not hackers. A hacker only is a preschool girl, while a cracker is the mass killer with a corresponding criminal record full of sex crimes. Ace actually was not a cracker. His collecting data is a trifle, which a real cracker is not occupied with since he thinks bigger. While a hacker is placed hacking into a McDonald's branch, a cracker only feels satisfied after he obtained control over at least a dozen nuclear warheads. There aren't many crackers, since most of them do not stay in business very long due to a lack of brain, which either was roasted by neuronal feedback of a defense program or turned into brain stew by a 12mm precision bullet of a sniper. Ace deactivated all the unimportant functions of the deck and only used all the stuff turning him into a criminal. His goal? Newton Technologies. Newton Technologies cyberspace domain looked like a huge cyberspace deck that could be entered with the avatar via the sockets. But Ace didn't realize much of it since he was in the source code mode. The artificial 3D world of cyberspace had been designed for naive friends of computing. Right after he had connected to the main interface of Newton Technologies mainframe, the sound of Corex X became louder. Not a lot, but Ace had to struggle harder to concentrate on hacking. Ace could not explain why this sound grew up again right now, but he had to go on. After he had left the public layers of the Newton Technologies system, things turned complicated. Almost all of his deck's performance was consumed to get through the password protected areas, although this was the layer of the most plain staff only. But he wanted to intrude more deeply. He went through the investigation logs and project databases, but there was no hint to the secret department to find. Just as he wanted to remove from the group mainframe and continue to search another place, the black spot he had seen at the club and that was destroyed by the destroyer program reappeared. But this time the black spot had spotted Ace and approached him. Suddenly a text document reading as follows was opened. Dear Mr. Lundquist, Since you have not met our data transfer order yet, there is no more business relation with you according to Article 745, Paragraph 9, of the data transfer contracts with external service providers. That is why we cannot support you any longer. 
Apart from the fact that you acted in complete opposition to our instructions, we are forced now to drop our coverage. You now are a security threat to the entire venture. We suppose that our hostile competitor shall care for your liquidation. The fatal agent you infected yourself with will work after we will have removed the shield. Your sincerely normal Miller, head of board, her corporation. Ace had hardly read the document when all the warning symbols of his deck light up. All the firewalls and the tech blockers were useless. You literally could feel how the defense programs of the Newton Technologies mainframe drilled into his deck like tiny needles. Something had shielded him before which he was gone now. The black spot. Supposedly another Her Corporation hacker also was gone. Now Ace recognized what he got stuck in. He found himself in the middle of a group war between a big software company and a large military company. The cause of the conflict was a Newton Technology software called Corex X. Now he understood the noise in his head. The program not running on the deck. It's a computer virus that could be planted into brains. The future of warfare. Developed and investigated by Newton Technologies, which her corporation tried to steal and applied successfully against Ace Lundquist. Now that it was too late, everything appeared completely logical. The sound of Corex X grew into a huge noise, even worse than the one he felt in reality. In his head, all imaginable frequencies were sounding at the same time. His neurons were torn apart by a huge orgy of sounds. The controls of his deck didn't work anymore. His entire system was controlled by Newton Technologies. His brain felt like it was going to burst. And then, it did burst. Blackness was around Ace when his existence became extinct. And the noise in his head ended. He didn't feel anything anymore. He was no longer in hell. Chapter 2 Heaven She was a real pro. Someone in need of a real expert would turn to her. She was one of the best at her job and her customers knew that. That is why she almost made as much money as a franchise branch manager. Well, her job was a little more dangerous than to boss employees around and to tip instruction logs. Her tax return identified her as freelance private investigator with a license to sentimental erotic missions. But today, her field of action has been extended far more. In less progressive times, she probably would simply have been called a courtesan. Her main customers were wives in need of a cause for divorce. Her success rate was almost 100%. It is true that men are too simply structured. More challenging were jobs that involved spying. People who know or possess important things usually are aware of that fact and therefore are very suspicious. These jobs require more than just a suitable outfit, the appropriate look and the corresponding abilities aped. There are about things like safe picking, hand to hand fighting without weapons, and making disappear secret documents in orifices of the body. That was at least what she had thought until that one night. The job came relatively late. She was just stretched out on a designer hotel sofa and lacklessly zapping through the evening's TV program from Asian porn stations. The hotel was a business hotel in the middle of a business center. She glanced at her communicator that showed all the important details of the job. The target was a boy who should be handed over a data chip in some scruffy club. Her job was to see that the boy felt comfortable, took the chip home and stored the data in his cyberspace deck without looking at it. The guy was a loser, who lived somewhere in a sub-ghetto and hasn't been able to pay his rent during the last few months. Since he was somehow occupied with the data in cyberspace, he probably was so important to this chip thing. Everything looked like a very simple job, which yielded acceptable profit. 
Immediately after receiving the job data, there was a knock at the hotel door and a Robert Footboy brought the outfit required for the job. It was a very skimpy go-go dance outfit. She went to the door and took the package from the robot. The annoying thing with Robert Footboys is that they always want to be tipped and therefore remain at the door with a credit card slot blinking in a gentle orange for exactly 10 seconds. She knows these switching circuit footboys too well and therefore exactly counted down the seconds before the closing of the door. She threw on the clothes and had to realize that she even liked it this time. Always to walk around in business suites with much too deep cleavage just doesn't really make happy. She cast a last checking glance to the mirror to see whether the makeup was correct, took some of the new overdose flush pills from her equipment and HN 245, codename Myra, was on her way to her place of operation. Actually, she liked the job. Everything went as planned. The guy came to the club, received the chip and Myra dragged him off. They went to his place, a worn out pit in one of those ghetto tenement houses. Somehow Myra found the guy cuter as she actually should have as a pro. She put the blame on the flush pills she had taken together with the guy. These pills actually really make you drowsy. Obviously, the guy was a freak living in the dicks crammed with old computers and cyberspace decks. He seemingly didn't spend very much time in reality. But Myra didn't do it either. The roles and personality she slipped into for her jobs weren't real either. As little as the feelings they pretended towards their job targets, blessed with X and Epsilon chromosomes. There was something different with this guy. Not that she was into stay-at-home computer freaks. Actually, she wasn't into any type of males. At least she couldn't remember anymore. But this one was simply sympathetic in a special way. Just like that, and Myra could not explain why. Perhaps there really is such thing as karma or the like. After they had finished, the guy fell asleep immediately. Actually, it was not bad. It is true, Myra already has had clearly better and longer sex. It was her job after all, but she now felt satisfied for the first time since what feels like a hundred years. She felt this kind of satisfaction that can only be given by a person you like and that you want to have around you simply like that. Is this what they call love? Myra couldn't fall asleep. A little dizzy, she stared at the stained ceiling while the guy beside her breathed evenly. She had to think. What was her meaning of her job? Normally it is always about some members of the board of large groups, politicians or scientists who had invented a new weapon of mass destruction. Myra could not imagine that this guy had done some bad things and deserves to be utilized fully in this way by her and her principal. She once again looked at him and got up from the bed. This time she would not be a pro and finish her job. She bent down and tenderly kissed his cheek, then whispered into his ear. Sleep well, Ace. A long time ago the Havel Sound was merely an agglomeration of individual towns and villages connected by means of motorways, light rail systems and waterways. Today, however, the Havel Zone is a sizzling place of intelligent life forms, steel concrete and holo ads being projected into the night like ghosts from another world. It certainly has always been crowded here, but there was enough space allowing a reasonable man to buy a halfway acceptable cottage in which he could lead a halfway reasonable life. This abruptly changed with a grand victory in the anti-Chinese expansive campaign that also is known as the World War III. While the military strategists, economic tycoons and political leaders of the Central European Alliance were celebrating the biggest military success of human history, the defeated packed their futons, kimonos, chopsticks and molten laptops into a rice bag and left their destroyed country to emigrate to the winners' countries. To completely defeat a hostile nation without even killing a single individual certainly is an eminent military achievement that will be listed by the military history experts immediately after Hiroshima's little boy. The intention of little boy was to demonstrate power and to force a nation into surrender. 
Comtois Prisé was the absolute power that had come over all the nations. Comtois Prisé sealed the fate of all China, Mongolia, parts of India, one third of Kazakhstan, one quarter of Russia, Thailand, Vietnam, Nepal, Kyrgyzstan, and any other national jurisdiction in the Asian area. This, however, gave a turn to the fates of four billions of human beings that found themselves again in the Middle Ages within an instant. The novel warfare agent Comtos Brise virtually destroyed all of the silicon in the areas affected and thus destroyed the entire technical infrastructure. China surrendered immediately. The fact that other nations were also affected rather was an accident that, however, did not really diminish the winner's euphoria since no country somehow important or powerful enough was affected that would have consequences to be feared. The basis of Comtois Brise was originally used by computer records to separate the small modules by simply melting away the silicon without affecting the rest. A scientist then found out somewhen that this basis could be implanted genetically into a monad resulting in something similar to a silicon-eating virus. This discovery was little sensation since the computer records could grow their silicon solvent by themselves and save a lot of money. The only thing to do was to add their culture's nutrient solutions at only a third of the price of the original solvent to keep them alive. An insignificant but economically thinking wrecker named Joe Gonzalez from Mexico City regarded this still too expensive and he experimented with the various media to replace these nutrient solutions. After having thrown always all of the Mexican fauna and flora into his cultures, he bewilderedly realized that the pollen of a tree with oval pointed leaves from his grandma's greenhouse just looking like any other tree worked. The cultures grew greatly and Joe Gonzalez had no more cause to worry because of his too expensive nutrient solutions. If Joe had known that this tree is called Oikomia ulmoides, or colloquially Oikomia, and almost exclusively grows in China, he would have been the wealthiest man on earth. However, this role has been assumed for Joe by a French student of military sciences, now who was doing a semester abroad in Mexico City and who wanted to have his old laptop wrecked at Joe's. This student was absolutely fascinated by Joe's method and took it over to France to develop on its basis, Comtos Brise, the death of the entire Chinese hardware. The war has been dragging over years, but in spring of 2049, the operation Comtos Brise that was planned in highest secrecy was started. The blooming period of Eucomia ulmoides was March to May, and thus prepared the perfect hotbed in all over China. In strategically positions in China selected by metrologists, geographers and botanists, the virus dispensers were positioned in secret operations and released one after another. When the Chinese high command realized what was happening, it eventually was too late already. The virus was on air already and spread over the People's Republic at the speed of a fighter jet out of control. Of course, the Chinese tried to counteract against Comtois Brise. Areas with little natural environment were less prone or could be protected. But this was calculated by the strategists of the Central European Alliance and shot missiles carrying Oikomia ulmoides pollen instead of explosives into these areas. The motherboards of the Chinese counter-missile systems very quickly turned to be electric scrap and thus the fate of People's Republic of China was sealed. The only problematic issue was that Comtois Brise was more robust than expected and Due to the vast bombing with pollen and due to unfavorable weathered conditions, even found the way over the bordering mountain chains of China into Russia, India, Kazakhstan and affected many other Asian countries. Actually, the bordering mountain chains and the Pacific Oceans were planned to be natural borders for Comtois Brise. Such a humane and total victory confronted the winner with completely different challenges that were not anticipated in advance. 
It was assumed that the Qings would behave well and stay in the country to rebuild it, while a Western-oriented government integrated the nation into the Central European alliance that, of course, should have to change its name. Unfortunately, it showed that Comtes Brise would destroy Silicon in China as long as Economa Olmoides existed there, since the virus didn't simply die. The medical fact that a lack of silicon leads to disturbances of growth, and that it would be really hard to graft a manual cut down the trees caused most of the Chinese, Russians, Kazakhs, Indians, Thais and Vietnamese to move to a country where the half-life of silicon did not last until the next blossom period. And that is how the Havel Zone became what it is now. An area of concrete stuffed with people of all ethnical races with a size of 5,800 million square meters. The end of the war and the thus initiated largest migrations of human history also was the end of the governments known until that time. Since the emigrants couldn't be delayed for a long time, they were allowed into the country and received passports. The increase of population by 10 times could not be coped within terms of organization by a rigid and bureaucratically inflexible government. Only the categorization of the care level for the bone atrophy caused by lack of silicon was a task for the health insurances that would keep them busy for the next 10 years. This task had to be carried out by other organizations that could quickly adapt to such a suddenly changing situation, such a thing had to be regulated by the market and this way the expression social economy obtained a very new meaning. It was the birth of the real mega trusts. The government handed most of its tasks over to trusts and privatized almost everything, causing much organizational effort and costs. After some years, when the emigration wave had finally stopped, and one third of the world population had found a new home, the government only possessed some prestigious buildings and a historically valuable name. Everything else was taken over by the trusts now. Ace and Myra saw the light of day after this new world order had already been established for a long time. Thus they didn't know anything else and only learned from their parents how it had been earlier times. After governments had turned out to be mere hollow cases, trouble started to go full blast. Wars waged by countries to another were rather civilized, but the things the trusts were staging now eclipsed everything that had happened before. They didn't talk about world wars any longer, since every conflict of the multinational trusts was automatically a global affair now. And it exactly was such a conflict Ace and Myra were involved into now. Myra only became aware of the situation when it was almost over already. Ace didn't exist anymore. The whole day after their night together she didn't find peace. She was tormented by thoughts of Ace. Normally, she was not interested in who her principal was that was neither important nor professional. But this time she had to find out. In this job, she had stopped being a pro anyway. It was no long search since her principal found her. With a shrieking ping, the monoflak bullet punched through the hologlass window of her hotel suite and drilled itself into the prize-winning designer wallpaper a hand span away from her head. Lucky again, hitting through the tinted glass, it is not easy even for a sniper. Of course, the sniper's boss also knew this fact and had taken corresponding assurance measures that burst open the door right after Myra had taken shelter behind the sofa. Four men, all dressed in black, entered the room through the haze of a heat explosive charge. Unfortunately, designer wallpapers were not produced with regard to fire protection and thus half the room was ablaze immediately. The entire room got filled with smoke. Myra was hardly visible, however, breathing was clearly harder now. She stayed behind the sofa and kept her head down. However, her four enemies would certainly have the idea to look exactly there within the next four seconds. That is why Myra tried a bit of diplomacy. What do you want, you filthy pigs? How about trying to talk before shooting into my head? 
The answer, in form of a handful of hollow shell bullets hitting the sofa and making colorful pieces of cloth tumbling through the suite, didn't make her wait long. The boys were not here to play. Okay, well then the hard way, Myra thought, pulled her needle gun out of the hidden holster below her armpit and answered the fire with poisoned needles. Due to the smoke, she could see as much as the killers, and therefore shot stuporously as they did into the nothing. But one of the poisoned needles hit the mark. Just as she wanted to duck into her shelter again, the automatic snuff-out device of the hotel went off and white chemical fire extinguishing foam fell from the ceiling. All the designer furniture in the suite was completely ruined now. That was Myra's chance. She leapt from behind the sofa, firing into all directions where she supposed the guys and sallied out of the room. It worked. The guys were completely taken by surprise by the white something dropping onto them and thus failed to stop Myra with some of their bullets. They wanted to correct this failure and ran after her. One didn't get further than the door where the poison from Myra's needles paralyzed his circulation. Lying there, he was buried by a white form. Myra took the stairway down. Meanwhile, the fire alarm sounded in the entire hotel and panicky business people ran through the stairway in direction to the exit. Nobody noticed that Myra carried a needle gun. Myra glanced up and saw the remaining guys storming through the stairway after her. The guys didn't fire indiscriminately, since it supposedly would not be good for the image of their principal if they shot some influential business people during this action. In the basement, Myra jumped over the counter of the reception and aimed with her gun into the direction of the stairway door. The three guys ran through the entrance and Myra fired poisonous needles at them, aiming precisely. Since it always took some seconds for the poison to show its effect, the guys went on running, almost not feeling the little injections through the poisonous needles. After some meters, they collapsed one after another. In the way they were arranged, one on another, now they could be a nice modern piece of art, Myra thought when she jumped back over the counter and swiftly approached the guys. She rummaged around the pockets and found what she was looking for. Each of them had an ID card with him. Her corporation security staff, Myra was sure. This also was their principal. Only they could know the whereabouts of Myra. Obviously, her corporation had not agreed to Myra finishing the job prematurely. Myra was not sure about what this killer command meant, but it certainly didn't mean any good. She had to know what had happened to Ace. It would be foolish to go to his home. Her corporation would observe his tenement. There was no other thing to do than to contact him in another way. She left the hotel running just before the arrival of some fire department helicopters that formed the hotel from the top to the bottom. They have become very carefully with fires after complete quarters of the Havel zone had burned down due to a small fire. Myra ran to her motorcycle parked in a lot in the front of the hotel to flee. The motorcycle, a black shining device resembling a dangerous reptile, was still there and didn't blow up when she activated the ignition. This was a good sign so far. She switched from the economy mode to the race mode and pelted into the nocturnal Havel zone traffic at a speed that would have made the roadrunner burst with envy. While Myra rushed through the traffic, passing heavily built deep freezing transporters and rickety old petrol cars on the left and on the right she could think straight again. Something went terribly wrong and Ace certainly was in deep trouble. She really feared for Ace. This made her even more anxious. And she suddenly realized that she loved him. That was new to her, but she couldn't suppress this feeling any longer. Myra felt it deep inside her. This strange feeling that makes your heart jump when you think of the other. This inner content having someone you love around. This desire to see him again. Her heart pounded heavily like the pendulum of a huge clock. Her mouth became dry. She only knew one thing. She had to contact Ace as fast and secure as possible. Talk to him and hopefully to meet him quickly again. Since Ace was a hacker, 
and a data collector, he most certainly would have a possibility of contacting cyberspace for his customers to contact him. And this would also be the way for her. Naira needed a possibility to securely get into cyberspace somewhere and make it impossible to her corporation to spot her. Hiding completely within cyberspace is almost impossible, but here are always ways to make oneself at least almost invisible. The simplest method is to block the data exchange between cyberspace and the DAC in a way that own data is not sent after entering the space. The problematic thing then is the lack of interaction with other avatars. It is not possible to enter cyberspace addresses. You simply hang ex animately in cyberspace and only can observe what's happening around. But exactly this would already be enough for Myra. She would search for Ace's mailbox and wait there until it's activated, that means Ace loads his messages. Then she would switch back to data exchange immediately and contact him. The plan was certainly not the best one, since most of the halfway able hackers would suss out this trick. But yet it gave a searching guarantee against being detected by her corporation. Above all, if Myra entered cyberspace using an unknown address. Thus Myra rushed through the Havel zone, searching for an illegal cyberspace cafe. Cyberspace cafes are places where you could rent a tiny cabin with deck and link up. Legal cyberspace cafes are countless, but they have a disadvantage of being registered and having a visible address in cyberspace. This is not the case with illegal cyberspace cafes, since the shop owner simply has tapped any glass fiber line and linked his cafe. Some pirated and illegal Russian software managed the rest to connect the cafe with cyberspace. After about two hours of riding through back streets and interviewing dodgy characters with gas masks, Myra had found what she was looking for. The shop's name was The Pink Cable, and it came up to all the expectations of an illegal cafe. Sweetheart took the wrong turn. A guy in a stained vest, whose body mass allowed to imply a life full of fast food and much too little exercising set from behind the counter. Immediately, the hats of all guests turned into the direction of Myra. All of them guys looking like the one behind the counter with as much or even much more fat on their bodies. All of them gawped at her, as if an extraterrestrial just had entered to ask for the way to Alpha Centauri. Obviously, the guys hanging around here didn't see very many real women. Oh, isn't this the Hello Kitty Superstore? Myra answered hurriedly and approached the counter. The guy dumbfoundedly stared at her for a moment until he finally recognized the joke she made. Myra pointed to one of the cyberspace cabins. How much is it? 100 credits per hour. The guy answered quickly and seized Myra up. Girls with a big mouth made him feel uncomfortable. Myra leaned over the counter and looked him into his eyes. Tiny sweat drops started to form on the guy's forehead. Then go ahead and take the time. I cannot say for how long I shall stay in there, she whispered. Ooh, of course, the guy stammered now. Myra pulled her needle injector and gently stroked the barrel exactly in front of the guy's face. Any of you blokes here who should think of bothering me while I'll be there will receive one of my little friends with nervous poison, right? All right, you shall not be bothered, I promise. He had to swallow. Myra aspirated a kiss to her gun and made it disappear again. When she turned around to go to one of the empty cabins, all of the other guys avoided her look and gave way. Guys hanging around in cyberspace cafes are losers by definition. Ace's mailbox was not hard to find. She only had to search for Ace Lundquist's data collector and to travel the specified destination with her avatar. The mailbox resembled an orca's mouth. The messages were posted in the form of surface. After the message was read, the orca chewed on the surfer and confirmed the receipt with a satisfied belch. That was what Myra had to wait for. She disconnected the data link. Myra waited less than 30 minutes. Something disengaged her deck. She wasn't able to do anything at all. None of the deck's functionalities worked. She clicked on the icons without seeing an effect. Nothing happened.
Something blocked her completely. The functionalities were restricted anyway, since she had disconnected the data link, but now absolutely nothing was going anymore. Not even an emergency exit was possible, since the blocked data connection could not transfer the required data. Only now Myra realized how stupid her idea has been. Right after Myra was caught in cyberspace this way, she heard an electronically distorted voice. Did you think you could hide from me this way? Ridiculous. How stupid do you think I am? The voice laughed hollowly. Myra wanted to respond, but she couldn't. The block connection didn't allow any communication. So you are also part of it. I should have imagined. Things like that don't simply happen. Not to me. But I was framed. What gave you the right to decide on my life? What gave you the right to extinguish me? Nothing on this earth has this right. But you and your like are not interested, the least as long as the profit is sufficient. However, you made a mistake. A big mistake. You thought you had gotten rid of me. Simply blew the neurons out of my brain and made my flesh die. Then you were sure that little Landquest doesn't exist anymore. Well, your little program contained a bug. I'm still here. The voice paused, and Myra sensed a stinging certainty. This was A speaking. Something was absolutely not correct. What was he speaking about? He should be dead? Extinguished? But how can he speak to Myra then? Myra wanted to shout a question what was wrong. Comfort him, but he would hear nothing as long as the connection was not linked. Especially you disappointed me the most, he continued. I thought there would be something between us. I really thought so. I thought that you might become my girl. I really felt that you and I could be the real thing. But I was so stupid. Driven by carnal desire, I was controlled by my biological mass. But this is over now, thanks to Corax X. Ace Lundquist is merely a rotting piece of meat. However, Ace the Hacker still exists. He still is in cyberspace and is more powerful than ever. My physical ego was destroyed, but Corex X did not succeed in destroying my mind which is still here. A soul existing in cyberspace just like in paradise. Who had to thought this possible? Is it magic? Or religion? Or is it just physics? Who had thought something like that would become possible? He laughed again and Myra inwardly shivered. She would not believe what she had heard. But I shall take revenge on every one of you. Your friends at her corporation will be in need of a new mainframe within a few seconds. Newton Technologies will make the same experience. This will make the entire business world break down and nobody will learn who is to blame since the one to blame has died already. Again the mental laughter came up. Myra tried to speak somehow, but her words didn't find their way to Ace. They didn't even leave her head. For you I conceived of something special, my sweet dancer. I got to know you as the dancer. As the dancer you made use of me. And that is how you will die. I rewrote Karak's axe for you. It was rather painful being killed by this stuff, I can tell you. For you, I've planned a little more amusing. Of course, the final result stays the same. Then something happened to Myra's deck. A program installed itself, and all of a sudden she was in control of the deck again, and she immediately switched to full data transfer. Ace, no! You don't understand! I didn't mean you no harm, really, Myra shouted at him, when her communications functions worked again. Myra cried tears and dropped on the deck above, which her motionless body set linked to cyberspace. Like dewdrops, the tears dripped off to the black plastic cover of the cyberspace deck and disappeared forever in the blackness of the cyberspace coffee's cabin. An avatar could reproduce the emotions of its user, but the depressiveness that Myra felt now, a system couldn't process or reproduce anywhere near complete. 
A deep darkness laid on Myra's mind, a grief she never had felt so strongly. The avatar of Ace appeared before Myra. It was a one-on-one -on -one representation. He looked at her expressionlessly, but it hesitated. I don't believe you, Myra. All of you only used me. And when I didn't fulfill my function, you simply handed me over to death, Ace said in his real voice. The arrogant tone from before was gone. No, no, Ace, please, you believe me. I didn't mean you any harm. I intended to protect you. Ace, please, do understand. I cancelled the job. I didn't want to drag you deeper into the matter. Whatever has happened, even if I can't understand, I wanted to help you. That is why I'm here. Tears ran like an endless river of sorrow from her eyes. Ace didn't respond. Please, Ace, I didn't want anything of it to happen. Myra sobbed. Her thoughts overturned. She neither knew what had happened nor what would happen. There was only one thing clear to her. She wanted him to understand her, that he could forgive her. Myra, is it true you really want it? Ace couldn't get any further. Please, Ace, understand. I do love you, Myra shouted at him. The deck was in real trouble to represent this emotion, but the message arrived Ace unmistakably. He whispered, so do I, so do I. Then Corex X started. No, 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 Ace shouted as the program started and Myra's avatar resolved into nothing. Myra heard Ace's voice fading in the background when everything around her became blurred and formed in a new world around her. Cyberspace disappeared and something new was built up from the pixels around Myra with ornamented wood, paneling and glistering crystal chandeliers. All the tiers were filled with excited audience in finest dresses. Gentle music from the orchestra pit filled the place with a gently bouillon sound. Some spotlights lit the stage before, which the red velvet curtain slowly opened. And in the center of all, that was Myra in a white lace ballerina costume. Whatever just was happening here, all of it augured ill. Myra had to get out. Emergency exit. But nothing happened. It was too late. Corex X activated itself in Myra's brain. Everything felt so real. The murmur of the excited audience, the cracking stage planks under Myra's feet, and the smell of perfume and old wood. All spots were directed to Myra and the music grew into a fast melody. Myra simply had to dance. She couldn't help it. She had to move with the music, tossing her body to and fro, letting her feet slide over the stage floor and moving the arms up and down in swinging movements. An inner calling forced her and she even hadn't the chance to defend herself against it. Her dance became faster and fiercer. She jumped over the stage with stretched legs, whirled around and spun mind dazzling pirouettes. The music turned into a furious noise hammering into Myra's head, but this pushed her even more and forced her to surrender to the dance. She had lost control over herself. The music swelled to a shrieking crescendo. The audience was cheering and applauding. Then, as the music seemed to be merely a deafening noise, Myra jumped in the air. She jumped like she had never jumped before. A jump that never wanted to end. She seemed to jump through the structure of space and time. The theater had given way to an endless nothingness long since, but Myra didn't stop to speed away. Then, as immediate as Myra's jump into nothingness began, cyberspace popped up again with its colorful forms and abstract formations before Myra. However, it felt completely different. Her avatar was no longer a mirror in cyberspace. Myra herself was the avatar in cyberspace. In this moment, the lifeless body of Agent 245, codenamed Myra, fell from its chair in a rundown cyberspace cafe named the Pink Cable. There is no night in cyberspace. It always was bright day, 
programs didn't sleep. Myra now knew how it is to never rest, always to roam restlessly. A soul detached from its physical body didn't have this need any longer. Cyberspace enveloped her like it trusted, being a part of which it had become now. Cyberspace was huge and grew every second by more terabytes. Humanity fed it with data uninterruptedly, so that its size could simply no longer be measured anymore. If you knew what you were looking for or where you wanted to go, you would be able to navigate there, but navigation couldn't find souls. Myra knew that his soul was somewhere in cyberspace. She wanted to tell him so much and to ask his forgiveness. But above all, she wanted to be with him, be together with him for eternity, here in timeless cyberspace. Thus Myra started searching for Ace. Even if the search took centuries, Myra would find him. Three quadrillion bytes away from Myra, another soul caught in cyberspace made the same decision as Myra. The soul's name was Ace, and it went out to the endless search for another soul named Myra. They both were caught in another world, only consisting of data and binary codes, but the search for paradise had only just begun. Just, just begun. begun. Just begun.